I have enjoyed doing the, the archaeology, the art of um, you know, different areas that we've done. And obviously, um, I do love bricks. <laughs> um, I do. Um, but unfortunately, well, what I want to do now is that so often I'm standing here and you guys are getting an article of the week and you're talking about different areas of Britain that archaeological excavations are actually taking place at. Um, and I'm always saying that we'll, we'll visit that one day and the time has actually come now, so we're going to be doing that over the next few months. Um, so one of the, one of the things that um, maybe is a, a fitting uh, point to end on with the archaeology of the art of things is actually coins. Um, we all um, go to foreign countries and look at coins on display in the museum. We, we carry coins around with us for the time being. Uh, because you are all aware that the uh, UK government is planning to okay. um, cut us using coins soon. Um, Sweden's already gone over to having a cryptocurrency, <coughs> so um, coins will be in the past one day. Um, but coins themselves um, have always um, seen uh, and, and to be seen to be seen for over 2,500 years as the staple of a large. Um, numbers of economies across the world. Coins should not be just seen um, as a round circular thing. Uh, they can be seen to not just be in metal, but to be seen to be in um, forms of um, um, artifacts such as um, shells. Co um, coins can also be coined the phrase <coughs> in the sense of porcelain coins. There, some countries on the planet are using plastic coins today. Um, you can have coins made out of a variety of different things, and we, we, we've got to really see this. Um, coins and money sort of interacting together. Uh, and one of the, one of the greatest um, um, compliments I've received recently was that um, we, we, we've been doing these little podcasts, and we did a podcast about a Roman coin and the Roman coin's journey throughout the ages being smelted and so on. And, discussed this with my co-host and somebody said it's an absolutely brilliant way of discussing an artifact going through what it's what it's gone through uh, but one thing that coins um lots of coins don't go through is the sense of aging um, you can have coins um that were produced 2500 years ago and they haven't aged one bit they're in fact timeless artifacts um, they're all pervading um, and wonderful arbitrary inventions of humankind. You can see on here the archaeology of money, uh, the archaeology of coins, hand in glove, as I've already said. Um, and the goal of today is more or less to sort of look at some of the manifestations and then come back to the everyday coins that you have on your table. Um, alas, um, I, I focus so much on the early origins of the coins that when it comes to the Roman coins, which is sort of um, that sort of goes by pretty fast. So, coins themselves can tell us about um, humanity. They, they can tell us about who's reigning, who the leaders are, what, what, what people um, saw as precious to them. So the Dura Treaty tribe of England um, 200 years ago may have put um, an image like the Effingham horse on their coins. That was important to them. Uh, for example, the people of the Archenoi would have seen particularly the um, having barley portrayed on their coins. Um, in the Roman world, particularly, you see the uh, representation of a Roman emperor, or you might see on the um, reverse of the coin uh, the representation of Romulus and Remus. But the very, really early principles of coins um, go back to a time when people needed to know the value of something. And um, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at this um, here, and as I get my cursor across, Lynn, you're in the room, it went perfectly last week. Well, don't worry, I'm not going to be here for the next two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> two and a half years? Weeks. All oh, right. Well, don't worry, the book won't be coming out that soon. Um, so what, what you've got, you've got sort of um, pig's tusks, and you've got you, usually cowrie shells or periwinkle shells, You've got golden coins, you've got little ingots, you've got horseshoe type things. Um, various different things have been used um, and with a sense of being that they're um, used as a form of coinage. Um, and money itself 
um, is to be seen as the staple of human humanity, really. Uh, but some of us who want to get away from it, um, that's simply not the case. The first coins that we actually see being classed as coins <coughs> are coins from um, an area that once, a, a kingdom that once uh, dominated the whole of Turkey and a, a landscape known as um, Lydia. One thing, one thing particularly about coins is that coins themselves can very much be seen linked to archaeology. Um, whenever, whenever I'm doing archaeology, I'm always asked, um, what have you found? Um, have you found any coins? And usually the answer is um, no. Um, archaeologists very rarely ever find coins. Um, the, the first coin I have ever found was a wonderful coin from Emperor Trajan um, on the, my archaeological excavations at Kai Went. Um, and when I found that coin, um, it, it was a bad luck charm, really, because I used to take it back and forward to the excavation to show people. Um, and uh, on the way back from the excavation one day, um, we had a serious accident on the motorway, both tyres blew on the car, um, and the coin um, ended up on the motorway uh, with my blood. The coin was recovered by the police, and I still got that coin, so it's a very unlucky coin indeed. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, coins themselves intrinsically linked with archaeology. Uh, the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture. Um, coins are part of that great material culture. And, like the beast that you can see here, um, the portrayal of what people felt that was important to them was to be placed on coins from a very early age. So the first coins themselves, actual coins, square coins, circular coins, pallet coins, or whatever you want to refer to them, not exactly circular, come back to about 700 years BC. Um, but the concept of using currency on money goes back a lot further than that. You've got civilizations like the Minoans, you've got the Egyptians. Um, there were forms of currency and there were forms of things that they were using um, in the marketplace within their civilizations. It could be said that um, coins have been overstudied um, because they're of value. Um, but there's still a great deal that we can actually learn from them. Um, and we can learn a great deal from the absence of having coins as well. So the age-old question is, when, when Wales has got all the gold, um, why didn't the people of Wales produce any coins when the Ike in gold or any metal at all. Uh, we're providing the gold and the people of the Ikenoi are producing gold coins. When we didn't produce um, gold coins and we had the gold, why, why is that? Okay, well, I don't really need an answer to that. The first, the first coins actually being produced were, were being created out of an, a natural amalgam of two metals, gold and silver, known as electrum. Those that have been up, uh, with me to the site of St. Peter's Church um, not that one, St. Saint, Saint Peter's Church um, at Brinner um, a few weeks ago, um, will have heard me mention something known as an electron cross. Um, an ele ele the electron cross, apparently associated with King Arthur at St. Peter's, um, had a quantity of gold and a quantity of silver in it. And th these are the types of things that the first coins were made out of. In fact, uh, just a precursor to these first coins, what we're seeing in the archaeology is electron rings. Um, you don't usually come across the term electron anymore, but um, that is a material naturally occurring amalgam of the two metals. Um, that's what was made into coins in the first place. What we, what we do see throughout history is that when you find tin, you usually find a little bit of silver there as well, and you usually find a little bit of copper, um, maybe a little bit of zinc. Um, when electron itself is just a natural amalgam of the two together with a tiny bit of tin or something else chucked in there. Um, there's one interesting thing which I'm sure you'll all find uh, fascinating. When, whenever you uh, come along um, with articles associated with coin hoards, um, be as it may that most archaeologists have no idea what a coin hoard is about. They always come up with a wonderful um, adage, don't they, Alan? 
Uh, we're going to come back for these. You know, coins are buried and these things, the uh, um, Stettersham treasure, um, all these different things, they're going to come back for them um, and they're going to um, use them again, right? Um, and they ever, ever came back and uh, the coins are left in the ground and that's it. Some, some archaeologists do postulate that in fact all this stuff was deliberately buried because it was no longer needed, it was no longer required. Um, or in fact it was money of the dead. Um, when, when, I was, when we buried my nan, well we had the cremation for my nan last week, uh, I was handed my nan's ring. Uh, my nan's gold ring. I had decided a week earlier that that should be burnt with her, um, but um, some of the family members didn't want that. I've still, I've got my nan's ring with me now. Um, that I felt should have actually gone with my nan, um, even though it's a valuable ring. It should have gone with my nan. It should have, it should have gone with her. Okay. Other people have a different idea about these things. In other words, it's dead money. It's it's something that should go with people passing. Just because it's of value, like my nan's ring, just because it's of value, it doesn't mean to say it should be kept <coughs> with you. It doesn't mean to share, say it should be kept with the living. It should now go with the ancestors. Um, and that's what some archaeologists think. Um, there's living money. The money that you've got on, your ta on the table here is living money. Um, and that itself is the money that you've got in circulation. And there's dead money, as I've already <coughs> mentioned. This, this, co this coin itself um, is, is a fairly early coin. Uh, this is from roughly about 800, 500 years BC. It's not one of the oldest Lydian coins. Um, and one thing that Herodotus wrote in about the 450s about the Lydians, the earliest coins... Um, are found mainly in the parts of modern Turkey that formed the ancient kingdom of Lib Libya. Um, Herodotus stated that the first people producing coins was in fact the Lydians. They were producing gold and silver coins. He actually had one thing wrong. They weren't producing gold and silver coins at all. They were actually producing electoral coins, which is gold and silver amalgamated together, just to be a little pedantic. So he was right. Um, he was writing about a past society. The, the Lydians were eventually taken over by the Persians, and bits of the Lydian landscape um, was actually taken over by the Greeks. Um, and familiarly, they would come across many of these coins indeed. Um, and this is something that the Lydians maybe, not maybe at all, the, the animals wandering around uh, Turkey, Anatolia, uh, the, the Lydian landscape, they, would have had, they must have had access to lions. They must have. Must have. Because they wouldn't have been able to um, portray a lion in such a beautiful way as you see it there. What we do see is that people do their best to sort of replicate things and how they think a lion looks like. To actually produce something like that, you need to have a lion in front of you or, or you need to have a, had a good access to, to what this beast looked like. Um, and coins themselves tell us about the landscape, tell us about what, again, was important to them. Hopefully one day, I will never be talking about elephants on the planet all being extinct and all we've got left is images of them. I Hopefully that's not going to happen. Um, but obviously lions and lionesses and other beasts are long since extinct within the um, landscape of Turkey. There may be one or two wild beasts here and there. But these would have been a populous thing for the people to associate with. And to associate with something gives it its value. You, you understand that, um, not to sound patronising any of you guys, can I nick a poem in a minute? Mm -hmm. Not to sound patronising, right? Um, that's obviously a pound coin, right? But the representation on the reverse, it represents its value. The thistle on the reverse represents this coin value. The thistle is, the, is what the coin's meaning is. Um, and this is what we see in the past. I know it's a certain shape and a certain form, but I know we'll all agree that some coins in the past look very similar to other coins, and you may have made this mistake. I've had five pence pieces, and, and um, they look like old half pence pieces, because they're really poorly produced in the wrong things. Um, 
um, because there's, there's just a base metal and they go really corroded quickly and they look like half pence pieces, right? But if you look at the design on that half pence, uh, that five pence piece, you'll know the difference between a half pence piece and a five pence piece by the design on it. Um, this is what these designs mean. Thank you. This is what these designs mean. That they're meant to tell you of value. A few interesting facts coming up, actually. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to um, go into there. An easier way of doing this. Um, uh, we'll move on. We're going to chuck them up for a minute, okay? It's not a very clear image, but the artifact isn't very clear either. It's sort of like a beast on there, and there's a stamp. This is an important little stamp. Uh, it's not exactly a round coin either. So, um, right, so here we go. So the, these, yeah, it does look like a bit of a sheep. Uh, so, so we're not just talking about a circular coin being the first obvious shape for a coin in history. The reason why they develop into circular coins is just a simple equation. Uh, when, I, when I used to be a child, I used to play with, um, I used to play with a, a saucepan of lead in my parents' kitchen to make um, cannons and stuff. You've done that, haven't you? Nice little mould, mm. pouring lead in there, yeah, right? I but I didn't actually tell my parents I'd been using the pan, and the next minute my, my mum would just put potatoes in there and boil them and not know that I'd just been melt, smelting lead. And one thing about when you smelt metal, particularly a, a, a low, uh, a, a metal like lead, or then going up the uh, table of gold and then silver or the melting points, when, when, when you pour it out onto a surface, it always, always goes globule-like. It always more or less forms into a twisted, mutated circle, right? Um, when people are actually pouring a bit of metal into a pellet mould, it, because it, the mould's circular, but it, the, the, it would have formed in that shape anyway. It would have formed in a roughly circular shape anyway. If you've got a square mould, um, pouring a small amount of metal in a square mould, it won't go to all the corners. It will form a more or less crude, weird little circle. That's how metal forms, most metals. Iron slightly different, okay? But you can't really know what you're doing when you're smelting iron. I'm not going to start that one. I know you probably do, but um, that's not me. Um, so, roughly, this is why we get these, these weird shapes. They, they almost look like um, um, sort of... Um, Tooth caps, don't they? I actually had one person in my Barry class last year. She was eating away, and uh, one of her caps came out, and it looked exactly like this. Um, and one of the silly buggers in my Barry class um, took some uh, glue and glued it back in place. Don't go there, Ellen. Right? Um, and he had, and had a mouthful from the dentist, apparently, the next day. Shouldn't glue things in with super glue, apparently. Um, anyway, so the, the, this, this, this is the... Um, this is, the ob this is the obverse and this is the reverse. The front of the coin is the obverse, and the reverse is obviously what's on the back. Um, so obviously what's standing out is what's on the front here. This is an electron coin. Now, the Lydians were really specific in their systems of making coins. So what you're not looking at is, is, the, is the size of a coin. You're looking at the design of the coin very specific. And the Lydians invented um, 700 years BC, 650 years BC or thereabout. They, they, um, they invented a strict um, system of weights and measures. The Egyptians were already doing this anyway, but the, the Lydians had a strict system of weights and measures associated with coins. The biggest coin, which we'll refer to as a stator, and um, I know some of you have actually seen this, but uh, uh, this is uh, this is a coin. Of, this is a very valuable coin of Ptolemy the fifth of Egypt, um, and a coin like a coin like this would be classed as a stator, okay, <coughs> usually a gold stator, um, and th this this holds it. Uh, you can all have a look um, in a short while when that comes up. The original first status for the Lydians measured precisely 14.1 grams. 14.1 grams. And what we do see in the development through history, can't really see it with modern day coins, but um, what we do see in development through history, particularly in the early medieval period, post-Roman, 
coming up to into the medieval period is that the moneyer would have his name or design on the back um, and the moneyer um, that that was his standard so you get the word gold standard from that that's that's the standard his is the standard and if he's clipping the coins on what not putting the right amount of silver into that coin right his, 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 his life is forfeit because his standard is that coin he's put his name to it okay and this is this is basically the standard that, that that's basically a standard of the coin so so you, you've got a very large um 14.1 gram um this is not a lydian coin this is, this is from about three uh, 220 years bc um you would have and then you would have had um, a half stator coin a, a third of a stator coin a sixth of a stator coin a twelfth of a stator coin wait for it um, one of 24th stator coin, one of 48th stator coin. I, think it, I don't think right. it could be 40, it must be 40 grams, not 14. No, it's 14.1 grams, clear here. Point. Well, and listen to this, and now listen to this. Kathy, listen to this, right? You also had a Lydian coin, which was of weight, 196th. Um, and that, that one was 196th of a stator, which weighed 0.15 grams. But that's, it, that's impossible. I mean, a gram is nothing, is it? They were able to do it. it, it they were able to the gram the sand. It, that's impossible. They were able to do it. They, 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 I'm just going by my notes. In the Roman period. In the Roman period. In the Roman period. In the Roman period. Kathy, you're going to have to go with this. This is a, this is a, this is a far greater <coughs> university uh, coming up with this than, than mine. They, um, what, ba basically, um, what's that? That's you. Where were we? Grams, we're looking at grams. But I'm just going with my notes. You're going to have to deal with it. <coughs> One ninety sixth of a stator, stator in weight, um, and I would I would make I would make a, a further a comment with that. In the Roman period, they had coins known as minims, <coughs> right? Any of you ever seen a, a Roman minim? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, well, they they are extremely tiny, but they're they're still ten times, hundred times bigger than a ninety sixth of a gram. What we're going to do? We're going to move on. We're not going to get so. But the Where main information come from. Pardon? This needs to be sorted out, Captain. Yeah, where did this information come from? Smithsonian. You haven't written it down incorrectly. No, it's clearly right, it's clearly there. I will show you this on the Is screen. It's America, are you sure it's not No. Here we go. There it is. 14.1 grams of full stator to 196 of a stator, 0.15 so grams. There was still a talk of, look, electron coins, clearly earliest electron coins were minted according to a strict weight standard. The denominations range from one stator all the way down to that. That's my notes. Um, we're going to move on because when, when I'm just going with my notes on that one. Um, do you know what, right? kathy has been building this up for weeks. It was all in there. It was all quiet. Everything was so flowing. I must agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I spent several years weighing out one to ten grams of various dye stuff. And the pot of tiny, and it was, you know, tiny. I do know my small weight. We're, we're, we're moving on. Gillian, is it best to move on? Yes, it is. Um, it cannot have been easy to tell some of the sp smaller denominations apart. We must assume that for many transactions, the coins were weighed rather than counted. <laughs> Maybe they did. Oh God's sake! Do you know you are so you are so rebellious today. Um, I can't be honest with you. Yeah, just pointing out. Yeah. Yes. I like it when everyone changes multiple. Yeah. Gillian didn't even defend me then. Oh wow. Move on, Gillian. Don't don't get involved yeah, in this. Don't, don't get involved. Alan didn't even defend me then. Right. Okay. Um, Gillian, you're going to have to deal with this. Yeah. 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 Did you come slightly to my rescue, John? Uh, <laughs> John, don't get involved. No. 
Anyway, the spread now moving moving on to a, a more more serious issue um, is that within within just a few hundred years, the system of coinage, the system of coins being used in commercial retail, has spread to the Greek yeah. islands. <coughs> We're spreading all the way over to um, the Hindu Kush, Afghanistan, and India. And within, within just a few hundred years, um, even the Chinese had ad adopted their own system um, of coins. Yeah, sorry, can I be... Go on then. Well, Herodotus was writing a thousand years after the supposed first coins were produced in this. No, no! How did he know that? No, I said 2,500. B years ago, not BC. Oh. So he's writing a hundred odd years after. But he still wouldn't know what was happening in China or India. No, because I'm moving on there. <laughs> I've said, I've said, this this is now nothing to do with the Rodotus. We, we moved on, we got over it, you know. <laughs> he's loving this, he is. <laughs> Kathy, zip it. Um, <laughs> so elect elect so the, the, the sense of using money, the sense of using coins, has within a few hundred years spread from all the way um, from China all the way through into Egypt, all the way through um, into Turkey. It's gone all the way across the Mediterranean. Um, and this is a system that's universally adopted. And having a universally adopted system means that whoever puts their stamp on those coins um, has to be bona fide, they're, they're, they're the value, again, that's their standard. Um, so moving from Turkey into the islands of Crete, uh, moving all the way uh, across the Aegean within sort of 100 years and then hitting the mainland of, uh, of Greece, Athens and so on. And what we do see, we, we see designs on these coins um, um, to what was important um, to the people that were now producing these coins. Again, electron coins is still the way to go for about 100 years. And then suddenly, electron coins are now being replaced, replaced by solid gold coins and solid silver coins. And then you go to the likes of Chinese, they, they, they've got um, base metals like iron being used, they've got copper coins. So this is all part of the system. And the, the wonderful thing that we're seeing is even early Lydian coins are finding their way in the archaeology Perfect examples finding their way into the archaeology by around uh, 400 or 500 years BC. So within, these things are spreading like wildfire fire ac across the planet. The only sort of continents they, these coins are not getting to um, um, are, are the Americas yet. So on these designs, important to some of the, the, the Greek people, <coughs> um, this is the city of Phocaea. The Greek city of Phocaea, and on this you actually see a seal. So that the, what's that important to them nice. is a seal. I thought they were pig's head and a fish. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you start, Andrea. Uh, this is a seal, yeah. It's got a leg. It's, that's, got, that's a thing, not a leg. It's a tortoise. Exactly, it's not a tortoise. Nobody asked you, for God's sake. It's not a tortoise. It doesn't look like a seal, It is a seal. It like a seal. The back half does, but the front bit. Well, I tell you what, right, you lot are hard work today. I just wanted an easy life today. Uh, you know, Lynn's been as quiet as a dormouse. You, you, you lot have made, made up for his uh, uh, sort of um, vocal life. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Okay, here we go. An Ephilim. They're Atlas, yes. So, yes. again... Again, somebody, somebody, somebody asked me. They said, "This, this is a, it is, this is either um, a very large reindeer or something crossover into an elk." But ov obviously, the point being is that looking at all these uh, animals on the coins themselves indicate again what the landscape was. Some of the earliest Lydian electron coins are also inscribed with names as well, um, names such as Welway and Khalil, and names such as Phanis um, portrayed. Um, actually in the writing on these coins. So I've given you an idea of the kings or the rich people of the landscape. Um, some of the coins in early Lydian script or early Greek script would read, I am the badge of whoever the leader was. So I am the badge. 
Instead of, I made this coin, I am the badge, this is my <coughs> representation, this is my value, this is my standard, this is what we'd be seeing on the coins. And again, looking at the landscape, um, knowing, um, knowing what I do know about Turkey, um, you do have reindeers there, but um, having very large beasts, um, reindeers in other areas, and very large beasts like elks there, have these long since become extinct or... Uh, these people would have associated with this design and wished to put them on their coins. Again, moving on. There's writing on the top, isn't there? Yeah, there is. There is. Uh, the, 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 right, the writing roughly translated. Uh, that's, that's an example of a Greek coin, roughly translated. I am the badge of Phanes, um, from, from Kia. Um, and again, writing being seen on coins, obviously the development of coins... The development of coins really starts here. So, so where, where we've got um, an obverse and a reverse is coming all the way from the Lydians. Where we've got lighting, writing on them is coming from the Lydians. Where we've got different designs on them is coming from the Lydians. The sense of a standard and the way it's coming from the Lydians. It all comes from these people, not the Romans or the Greeks or anything <coughs> like that. It's actually coming from <coughs> what the Lydians wished us to see. And, and they wished us to see um, that they're involved in the commercial world. The up up-and-coming commercial world that the planet is becoming. So everything that we see, see around us when we look at credit and commerce comes actually from these wonderful Lydians. Um, I'm going to move the slide again. And here we go. Oh, we don't want to do that one yet. Bingo. So... As an antidote for people talking about hordes, you can look at hordes in another light. You can think that um, people are burying hordes because they belong to um, you know, the dead. They belong to the ancestors. You can bury a horde. Maybe you're going to come back for it in the sense of some Roman hordes in Britain, if I believe that or not. It's another thing. Uh, you can think of coins being used as a dedication for temples. In this case, this is the earliest coin hoard found. Um, and this is associated with the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, which was found in 1904. Only with 19 coins, may I add. Did they bury it with 19 coins because that's all they had? Or did they bury it with 19 coins because uh, of another reason? There was certainly a, a great number of electron coins um, in circulation across the landscape of Lydia. And to have actually buried even a small number tells you that they, they, they had excess to actually bury them in the first place. This coin hoard itself dates from around 600 years BC. So within about 100 years, they're actually burying coins. Small numbers of coins. And then another hoard alongside it contained 74 coins. Now you would think that if these were if, if, if they had very limited numbers of these coins, you would think that they really didn't, really weren't able to bury them. Um, but they did bury these coins. And obviously, for, so coin hoards then develop uh, throughout the ages and there are different, different reasons for having these coin hoards in the first place. Uh, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, um, for those that know and don't know, uh, this is in fact in Turkey, southwestern Turkey. <coughs> Now, here we go. For those that are interested in um, things that go bump in the night, um, there's this one. Now, this, this is, as you can work out, um, a gold, um, a copper ingot. And this copper ingot itself um, is from the Greek, uh, um, from the Greek island of um, Zakros, um, which is off the coast of, of Crete. Um, this itself is a Minoan copper ingot, yeah? Now this Minoan copper ingot doesn't look like portable currency. Um, but in fact, going into the Minoan world, going across the Copper Age of the Mediterranean, even today there are ship shipwrecks being found with large numbers of these copper ingots on board. Um, those that will, will know of have uh, been to Cyprus, and maybe have been to the Kyrenian Museum in, in uh, Cyprus, you will know the Kyrenian uh, ship 
that was um, being worked on in the 1970s. And when they raised that ship, it contained a large number of copper ingots. And there's two reason, reasons why they're shaped like this. They're shaped in the form of a hide, um, otherwise known as hide money, a hide ingot. But there's another reason why it's this shape, is they're easily handleable. Um, when, when you've, um, into the bilge of the ship, which is obviously along the keel into sort of the, um, the base part of the ship, into the bilge, what, what they're doing as ballast, as a form of currency, they're filling up the bilge um, full of these copper ingots. Because you can't send a, um, a vessel out to sea without ballast, because it'll just bob up and down and it'll capsize <coughs> and you'll have a hell of a mess. Um, and I know this doesn't equate directly to what you've got in your pocket, um, but then again, it's currency, it's tradable currency around the Mediterranean. There's large, large, massive amounts of ingots were produced. Tens of millions of them were produced throughout the Bronze Age. And, and the other thing as well is, if you put three or four of these together, you could tie them up easily. If they were circular, you wouldn't be able to tie them up. If they, if they were square, you wouldn't be able to tie them up. But because they're this shape, you're able to bind them together. And that's going to add stability to your vessel. These things ain't going to bump up and down. And, you're going to, and um, these are going to be easily tradable items. Because when you, when, you when you think about it, one thing about trade is that you don't want to be going to a market with a pig and then coming back with five chickens. You want to go to the market with a pig and you want to come back with something that you can use to pay for something. You know, you want to be a... You, you know, your missus doesn't want a load of chickens and that's where the story of the bean comes from. The boy goes to the market with a, with a cow and comes back with a bag of beans. The mother's not happy, is she? But those beans themselves um, relate to portable currency, currency that's, that's movable. You can, you can move beans around, for example. You, you, you couldn't have come back with a, with a load of chickens under his arms. They would have just gone everywhere. So base, basically, um, the round piece of metal that you find in front of you could be a round piece of plastic, or even a round piece of porcelain. That's a strange one. Porcelain coins. But it's not as strange as it sounds. In the 16, 1700s, even in the early 1800s, we were struggling with the, with the Chinese market um, in, in, their, in their very um, rich porcelains, their very rich china. We, we couldn't compete with it. We, 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 we were producing something known as Delftware, tin plate, English tin plate, Netherlands tin plate, Delftware. That's what we were producing. It, we, it couldn't compete with anything from China. So you can imagine, if somebody's actually trading porcelain coins, that porcelain coin is going to hold money because we're unable to do it. it, it it's, it's, actually, it's actually an important piece of commerce, that porcelain coin, and it's produced to a high standard. Usually coins are to be seen to produce to a high standard, um, to have a quality, to have, to have a government issuing it, to have somebody issuing these coins. For example, um, in, the, in the Civil War, <coughs> coins become so rare that the pubs in this district, Cambridge, everywhere they were producing, you know, a pub would be producing their own coins. <coughs> so the Swan, say, for example, would be producing its own coins in the, in, the, um, in the 1640s, 1650s. And in the 1650s, 1640s, there's very little copper around. There was civil war was going on. And what you would do, uh, you would go into the Swan, for example, um, and you would pay with any currency that you had, okay? Maybe you had a gold nugget. Well, you wouldn't go to a pub with a gold nugget, but if you're, you're, you're desperate, you would. You might go into a pub with a chicken, and you'd think, right, okay. And what they would do, they would give you change back. And that, that change itself would be issued by the swan, yeah? And then you'd take the coin um, from the swan to another pub in Lantern Major or Cowbridge, and you, you, that would pay for another drink. And after a certain while, that other pub would gather all those coins together, take them back to the swan, and the swan would be asked to pay in, in, in the, the balance or the, the money of the day or something. You know, they would gather all the coins together. There's a bit of a fraud going on here at the same time because eventually the swan would say, right, we're not, we're, we're not 
you, you've got one week to bring in all the coins that we've issued. After that, they're not going to be any valid. Okay? So there's a bit of a con going on there as well. We, we see this, lot, lots, of, um, lot, lots of shops were doing this in London, for example. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the series Mudlarks. Um, it's quite a good, I like the series Mudlarks. And one thing that they, they were very much into with Mudlarks was that um, all the coins that they would find on the foreshore, and there would be loads of different ones. There'd be the candlestick maker coin. There'd be the Smithian coin. There, there would be the baker coin, right? And these would spread all the way around London. And after a certain time, the baker would close, right? So therefore, the money that the baker had issued was worth nothing, okay? So there was a big con in these coins. What I'm trying to say is that people throughout the um, ages have produced coins. The Tommy Shop coins, for example. Um, up in North Wales, um, in the slate quarries, you would never be paid in coin of the realm. You'd be uh, paid in Tommy Shop coins, uh, which could only be spent in the shop owned by the person who owned the quarry in the first place. So it was a vicious circle of almost slavery, right? But coins, when they were first being issued, were for trade, were meant to have a value. The sense of having forged coins back in the day was abhorrent. Nobody thought about forging coins. Um, coins were to be used in commerce, to make commerce easy. When somebody's coming all the way from um, India or China with silk, they don't want to go back with a cow. They want to go back um, to see their families. They, they want to go back to some, with something that's of value. And the smaller the goods, the easier they are to conceal and the easier they are to get home. And that's another reason for coins. Uh, today, most of our coins, well, in fact, I would say practically all our coins that we issue today have actually got no value at all. <coughs> you know, I, I've, I've, been, I've been walking across fields and, and you think, oh, wow, there's a coin there and you pick it up and the first thing you think, a two, more than two pence piece, the first thing you think, oh, wow, it's a, uh, it's, 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 it's a half penny from Queen uh, Victoria and you scrape it away. It's, it's a coin issued in 2008 because there's so little copper on them that the iron underneath comes directly to the surface and they look old. Uh, so, but initially, the sense of value to coins was the be all and end all. It had to. It, 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 you needed to have some value, and this is this is what we're looking at. Things slowly start to change. When I say slowly start to change, they change within a hundred years. Really, um, we see a new, up and up and evolving empire called the Archmenid Empire. The Archmenid Empire, <coughs> for, for, to get your eyes around this, um, Elaine, um, Ellen, uh, you think of Iran, Iraq, um, Syria, and then, then it conquered the Lydian world. What we're going to do, keep that there. What we're going to do, I want to show you another um, illustration of it. Um, um, <coughs> There you go. That's for you, Alan. So that, that huge world of Lydia, you never heard of it. It was like one of those empires that went up and down. That's it. The Archimedes Empire itself spread all the way from the east into the west. And spread all the way from the east, further into the east. It was a huge empire, Archimedes Empire. Uh, it's, it's sort of in the same ilk of, of Babylon and the Assyrian Empire and all those wonderful uh, empires, the Achaemenid Empire. And one thing the Achaemenid Empire struggled with was its empire. Moving chickens and, and goats around this huge, vast empire was not practical anymore. And when they conquered the Lydians, they came across the electron coins. And the Achaemenid Empire adopted this currency and it spread like wildfire across the Achaemenid world in such a way that the Achaemenid Empire as it conquered India basically started to say, right, this is how we trade, we trade with coins. It spread that quick. Within 50 years, it was a, it cost this vast world. Oh, and and then, it's, then the Chinese are uh, copying onto this now. They think, oh, right, okay, cool. Um, so the barter system 
was now slowly evolving into a, a, a real um, system of retail, of credit and commerce. The real system of money and coinage. It was, it was now moving on. The evolution of currency systems had moved from ingots um, and other things that we've seen at the beginning to small tokens. In the Chinese world, they were cast tokens. Um, and what we do see to test date to this, we, we actually see that, the, again, to what I've said, whatever designs on the coin is whatever value that coin is meant to have, again. Uh, and, and this goes back to the, another thing, right? Got to mention Julius Caesar at the moment. This goes back to another thing. Um, that when Julius Caesar um, came over to Britain, he wrote that the Britons had two forms of currency. They had iron bars uh, and they had gold coins. I think he wrote about silver coins as well. Um, and this had been an evolution. This, this had been an evolution over those years. And the, one interesting, the other interesting thing about Julius Caesar is many things. But the other interesting thing about Julius Caesar is that he was a well-known numismatist. He was a coin collector. <coughs> he collected coins. So can you imagine? Imagine. Julius Caesar sat there, and he's looking at a coin like this, and he's thinking, this coin is 200 years old. That's bloody old, that is. And then he's got a coin from the art minute world. Wow. Coins 400 years old. He's got a coin from the Lydian world. Oh God, that's 650 years old. And we look at these coins today, they're 2,500 years old. And Julius Caesar felt the same about coins as we do today. There was a sense of place, sense of history, sense of development. Julius Caesar was now here. Through all those stages of development. Just, we're just talking about coins today. That's all we're doing. We're talking about how important coins are. They are really important. To tell us what's going on. For example, when we look in the ground, not only can we work out about trade, you know, it's fascinating, is it not, Julian, that you can find a Roman coin in China. That gives you a great idea of trade. Yeah? But also that layer that we find that coin in China, and depending on where, that coin itself can date that layer without any other technology. This coin itself. Uh, if this was found in the ground in Britain, uh, we, we find very few coins that are from, um, from the continent before the Romans get here. But uh, this coin is in such a good condition um, that if you found this in a layer in Britain, um, that coin could probably date that, day, date that layer to roughly around 200 years BC, not far away from when this coin was issued in the first place. I'm going to do a one or two more slides and then we're going to take a break. Uh, there we go. I'm actually realising that I need to speed up. So we're, we're going, to do a, going to do a couple more minutes before Pete moans that he hasn't had his fang yet. So um, Lydian Lydia coins, Lydia and the coins um, uh, make their way onto Archmenid coins, as we've already mentioned. And what the Archmenid world is doing, they're changing the formula. What they're doing, uh, they're actually issuing gold and silver coins now. Not electron coins, they're actually issuing raw gold coins. Perfect, perfectly gold coins, that's what they're issuing. A perfect silver <coughs> coins. Oh, and then you've got an even better standard to what's going on. This, this image itself, which I will do now, uh, is um, this, this is sort of within that point of... Uh, the Lydian world, where the uh, minid world is actually coming over. Uh, and again, look at this beast. This, this is the obverse and this is the reverse. What's going on is quite, quite straightforward. Is that you've got the molten electron, molten silver, molten gold. This is an electron coin still. We're, we're sort of between the Lydian and the uh, minid world at this minute. Um, and what, what's going on, this is being poured into a mould. Um, and the mould itself, um, this, is, this is a clay mould, a pellet mould they're called. Um, and what's happening is, is immediately, as this has been poured into the mould, somebody's coming in there with a dye and, and putting a dye stamp in it. 
Um, this, this, is, um, this is known as an incus. Okay, it's known as an incus. And on some of the incus designs, they have really weird, ornate sort of things on them indicating what, what the um, value of the coin is. But equally, the value of the coin might be represented by the beast itself. Um, and one final image, and then we're going to take a break, because Pete is, is, is desperate to have his, have his fag and to see the women come out, I know. <laughs> look at this, look at this design here. This, this is another inscribed coin. Um, we, we've looked at, um, there was an inscribed coin earlier on. It wasn't really clear, it was, it was not this one. This is believed to have been, this is in the category of one of the very earliest coins issued. This was issued in um, Ephesus, dating back to around 625 BC. Um, and this, this itself, um, this itself spells the, spells the name of Phanis on it as well. The name Phanis seems to be quite prominent on some of these coins. And this is referred to as a stag. What's probably happening is that um, as, the, as the metal's cooling, these air bubbles are forming in the metal. This is not part of the design. But you've got a stag design here, and the incus itself, which is to be seen on coins for the next few hundred years, the incus itself giving you an idea of, of, of the maker or the value or something else like that. Um, so what we're going to do, um, we've got some exciting things to look at after the break. A, a, exceedingly um, rare coin there and another rare coin from a Roman empress, uh, one of the wives of Emperor Trajan. But that will be at the end. Any questions? No? Um, any, anyone want any eggs? Because I've got loads of duck eggs and chicken eggs this week. Loads, because I need to get I need to get them out. Anyone anyone interested in the other trip next week or the silly thing, let me know. And uh, you all know about the Colchester thing. We'll have a break now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, now what's happening is that um, as the um, Lydian world is being conquered by the Archimedian Empire, um... Thing, things are changing quite dramatically, and obviously um, trade, credit, and commerce um, alters. And what's happening is that people are actually seeing that instead of uh, using electron coins, um, that there is more of um, the nature of rulers to actually use gold and silver coins. And it's and it's almost as if this is this is a development onto a new stage. And the new stage is is that the Greek islands um, and the world towards the west. Um, are trading with the Ahmedian people, the Persian people, towards the east. And there is this great interchange of currency. Um, there's great interchange of the coinage between the, the two sets of people. And one thing that can be said, and I know, know I said this earlier on, but I can't stress any, any more the fact that um, the Lydian world, the Ahmedian world, and the Greek world um, are the precursors and likewise the Romans, um, for the varying different uh, levels of currency that we have today. Um, and obviously, you know, gold being more valuable than silver, and silver being more valuable than copper, and so on and so on. So, so we sort of get these sort of levels of currency from very early on. I know it sounds obvious, um, but that's, that's to be said. Um, and looking at this, this we, we, we had a quick um, jar before um, in the break didn't we about the fact that um, uh, how can they be making just solid gold coins your gold currency you know it's going to be very it's going to be very weak it's going to be very agile it's, um, and I'm thinking <coughs> the fact of the matter is if you're going to want to set your mark you know this, this sets its mark in its value and that stamp itself sets its mark um, from a sub ruler within the Ahmedian empire uh, within Turkey itself. And that ruler wants to say, actually, that this is gold. Nothing else in it. It's absolutely pure gold. Don't want to mess around. There's, there's no alloys or anything in. It's not like the electron coins that we had a few years ago. This is a solid gold coin. And uh, this, is, this, is, this, is uh, this is what these people are actually trying to say. This is actually a coin from King Croesus. And King Croesus reigned... As part as a as a governor within the uh, old Lydian uh, world for the Achaemenid um, uh, Empire, 
And there's another thing that's slowly starting to develop is, is um, east and west influences start to come out onto the coins. You have some coins coming up that actually show um, Greek leaders, and on the other side, you actually show Archimedean leaders on the same coin. It's almost as if they're trying to hedge your bets. You know, so if you're in a marketplace and you see um, a portrayal of an Archimedean leader on one side, and on the other side you see a portrayal of a Greek leader. Um, and it's, it's quite sort of that uh, European sense of money that we, that we have today, that you actually see on all these coins. So, so the unity on coins is seen very early on as well. It's sort of a leveller. Everyone needs to use money now. Um, well, it, that's how it started to develop back then. <coughs> um, what, what we do, what we, and um, this coin itself dates to about the 540s uh, BC. So again, coins have not been in circulation for a vast period of time. And the weight of this is 10.7 grams in solid gold. This is gold, gold, gold. And the next thing to actually come to is actually silver. The, the, other, the other leveler within... Oh, hang on, there we go. Uh, look, look at that coin. It's very, it's very similar to the other coin, but it's in silver. And, and obviously, the stamp on the back gives it um, gives a sense of value again. What it's worth. This is exactly the same white weight as the gold coin, ten point seven grams. This is issued also uh, by the governor Croesus or the king Croesus himself. That's quite heavy, isn't it? Really? Well, actually, um, on that moment, should we hand around this coin? And I, has everyone got for another about ten minutes? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're going to hand this coin around and you can actually feel the weight of this. Okay, I'll finish at 22, yeah? So we've got 15 minutes. So there you go. If you hand this around, this is a coin uh, um, from about just over 200 years BC. But it gives you an idea of the weight of the coins. So these, these are actually quite um, weighty coins. They're obviously holding their value. Again, moving on, I want us to, um, I want us to get directly into the Archimedes coins. Um, because this is a this is a governorship of the Archimedes world. I love this coin. This is Darius the first. Um, but what what we're going to do? I'm going to go to my notes so and this is a bit of a backdrop. Uh, so the Ar so it's interesting that <coughs> the Archimedes. Oh, yeah, Thank you. The uh, the Archimedes. Oh, okay, I'll do this just for you, not for Jane, for you. <laughs> All right, I'll just stand this way, all right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, much better idea. <laughs> See, Gillian, you are important, right? And Alan, you are important, right? And they're really yeah. down, okay? No favours, right? Whenever you get it's cream, right? Don't give it to him. Particularly the jelly. Right, I have many coins. Now, this is a world, and I've said it, that takes over Lydia, that, that wonderful landscape of Lydia. And instead of butchering and, and destroying the world, they, they don't. And they actually take on, they absorb the sense of currency, and it spreads across their world. Um, and the great Archimedes leader, Sirius the Great, uh, who's reigning from about 550, the great conqueror, who's, who's, who's having this great um, exchange of conquest across the, the landscape. And he even, at, at times... Um, those Persian um, empires are actually ruling over large tracts of Egypt as well. They're actually vast territories, huge empires, and nobody ever talks about them. The only way you're going to get huge empires of Sirius the Great and Darius, then Darius the First, is to ha actually have the ability to have gold coins worth their weight in gold and silver coins, and to have a currency. This is a currency that's able to be exchanged. Not the old copper bars of the Mediterranean, but these are able to be exchanged. A different, and it's um, a bit like the, that, that euro currency that, that we've still got in circulation. Those 27 states of Europe, where what you find is that um, in Ireland, you find a representation <coughs> of something to do with the Irish on a, um, on a one euro coin. And you have the Brandenburg Gate on a one euro coin and all the rest of it, right? For different parts of Europe. So that we know different parts of Europe, those different countries. And in the Achmenid world, they are different provinces and each of those provinces would have issued uh, their, their, their own coins the same weight as all the others the 10.7 large status as we've already seen grams 
Um, but they would they would have um, their governor's head on it, and they would have a stamp as their standard on the coins as well. So all those coins could be trusted around that wonderful world, and they were trusted. They were exchangeable. Um, that that bust itself, that bust itself with Alexander the Great's head on it. The bust of Alexander the Great's head was used on coins for over two hundred years after his death, because coins with the bust of Alexander the Great could be trusted. The, the old the old adage um, the, the the old thing about um, you know if you've got a, a, an old um, gold guinea that's going to be always worth its weight in gold. No other coin can do a doubloon. A doubloon the the doubloons themselves from the 15 1600s they were always trusted. You you could you could trade a doubloon anywhere in the world from the 15 16 17 1800s and it would have that value always. It, and this comes from an early age. A, a people's establishment um, of, 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 of a currency. This coin itself is King, King Darius I, um, king with bow and arrows. Um, and this, this itself, um, this itself, the coin from Darius I, this is where we actually see the real portrayal, well, one of the first um, uh, real portrayals of a leader, a real proper portrayal of a leader with a crown. And from this, we can actually work out that he's got a really nice beard. Uh, he's got loose fitting clothing. Obviously, the bow and arrow is important to his world, and it's going to be important uh, to the the um, Achaemenid Empire, the Assyrian world, the Persian world for many, many generations from then onwards. Um, this this next coin, uh, if I show it to you. This next one is a wonderful gold type stator. If we move on, there. Look at that. Absolutely beautiful. And again, this is an interesting thing. Um, about 420, this coin dates from. So they, they've been issuing. They, they've had their currency going for 110 years, and and uh, what you have um, showing Darius uh, portrait on the coin again. But Darius is long since left us. That coin itself, you're holding, you've got the, the bust of Alexander the Great on it. Alexander the Great's been dead 120 years when that coin's issued. On the back it says Ptolemy V of Egypt. Um, the, the great great grandson of Ptolemy, one of Alexander the Great's generals, on that coin. When you've got something that's trusted, it continues in circulation. The Queen's, the queen's head on the coin is trusted. This is why it's continually the Queen's head. Because it's always trusted. Those coins that were issued by, by King Edward before he abdicated, they were all dragged in. They were all forcibly dragged in because nobody wanted um, King Edward's head to be seen on the coin because he, his head could not be trusted. So these things are important, important levelers um, for society. It's important to know uh, the value of these things when they're in circulation. Um... This is, this is another um, Archimedes coin, if I can get my notes up here. Um, this is another Archimedes coin. Um, this, is, this coin itself, there's another interesting story about this coin. This is being issued by the Archimedes world in about 400 years BC. But this coin itself <coughs> is being found just, uh, just on the outskirts of the Afghanistan city of Kabul. <coughs> These coins are finding their way to, to the likes of Kabul, India, all the way into China. I know, I, have you ever um, read that book by Rajad Kirtland, The Man Who Would Be King? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the book's based on Alexander the um, Great establishing um, um, a, a city of, under his name, Alexander, right? It's all about that. Sikandagal, it's called, just remembered it. And it says in the book about all these coins of Alexander the Great ending up in Sikandar Gaul. It's in the book. I know it's fantasy, right? But there are bits of it are based on fact and also bits of it that there would be great chests of gold and silver of the Armenid world, Darius, Darius I, Darius II, Sirius, uh, then later on Alexander the Great and Alexander the Great's king. Alexander the Great conquered exactly the same area that was ruled over by the Achaemenid world. It was just fitting into that. And obviously, these coins themselves, um, it's, it's all the same thing. It's just repeating history. But instead of Darius I or um, Sirius on the coins, 
it's, it's Alexander the Great because it's ruled by a new individual. And this isn't exactly a perfectly circular coin. This is almost a, a drip made silver coin. Um, and, this, and these coins, again, um, showing you of the power that coins have had throughout history. Um, here we go. Right, this next bit now. And here we go. Right, these coins. Uh, these these are known as punch marked <coughs> coins, minted, uh, minted in the Kabul Valley, and the Armenian administration. So what we have, we, we've we've got basic, um, we've got a coin itself. The, these these have uh, these have been uh, relatively uh, hammered. So these have been hammered. That's clearly hammered. So that's hammered. So you've got a blank, and that's been hammered. So that's why it's curved. This, this is a, a silver bit, a silver ingot, a small silver ingot. And this has been hammered there. And it's also been hammered there, so it's bent. This is described as a bent bar, punch mark coin. This is also, um, uh, these are also being created in the many world, all the way up to the 350s. These are not exactly circular, but they're, they're ingot bars. And maybe you could cut this in two and you can make two coins. Maybe, I don't know. But this is what we're seeing. There, there's this development and there's, there's this link an importance given to these coins throughout history. Okay, let's uh, let's try and get um, very aware of time now. Um, this, these next coins, I'm going to probably go through these a bit more rapido. Right, here we go. Uh, look at look at these. Uh, these. These these are actually being produced in two hundreds. These are square coins from the Moira Empire within India itself. So what they've got, they've got a big metal sheet of silver. And they've cut these bits out and they stamp them. That's the standard. Each one individually weighed. So um, they're probably filed down to actually give that weight. And these are actually square coins. Exactly. So, so we cut it down until it's the right weight. Exactly. It's difficult in a crucible to actually pour um, into a pellet mould because how are you going to get the right... Obviously, after time, the skill of the, the smith would be there. But obviously... You, you need to have exactly the weight, right make, w the right weight of these coins. So, so do we know what sort of time they started <coughs> sort of cutting bits off to make half a coin? And, you know. um, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's so much of an urban myth. Um, but one, one, one thing that can be said is what they used to say: the old sort of a long cross coins um, produced in the medieval period. If you if you if you cut it in half, it's going to be half a pence, and if you cut it again, it's going to be a quarter of a pence, and all the rest of it. You do see that in archaeology, but how practical that was? Because if you're in a marketplace, right, you need you need a tool to cut the thing in half. You can't exactly bend it. So it's it, I, I know it's obviously you're not going to get the right weight if you cut the coin in half. It just doesn't work. Um, look look at these ones now as we come into the end. What what's um, What's happening here uh, is that we've got a um, couple more minutes, guys. What we've got there, these, these are associated with something, um, Likia, which is the, the southernmost part of Turkey in the west. You, you've got these designs then going over here. Um, but that would interest you, some of you there. The, the design of the Union Jack is there. The island of Lesbos, each of these islands issuing different things through the Greek world. It's spreading over now. Again, within 200 years, it's spreading all over this landscape. These, these, are, these are from now the Greek world. And, and look at that one there. This is from Agina. Um, and that there is, you can imagine, somebody spent a hell of a lot of time on the die there as it's, as, it's, as it's poured in. And then you've got the stamp there, the incus stamp. Again, that, that's representative of the person who made it. That's representative of Agina, the sea turtle. Obviously, you can learn so many things from these designs. Um, and as we're going, and look at that there. This is a coin from Athens. And, and the, these owls with the big eyes on a coin from Athens. This coin itself was actually discovered in India. And this dates from around 500 years BC. And it was found in India, almost perfectly looking. So within a small period of time, it was lost and buried. But this owl, typical symbol of the ancient Greek world, and it's still a symbol of the Greek world today. Um, still, I've seen this on uh, modern Greek coins today. 
Um, beautiful eyes. And as we go through, finally, look at that there. It is beautiful. No, you can't have a pet owl. And look at that there. And what, what I'm going to say about this is, is the owl is perfect. And you've got writing on it from, from Athens. This is a coin issued by Athens. Um, and actually, I'm looking at this and I'm actually thinking, um, you, you've, got, you've got the cheek muscles there as it comes in there. Beautiful. And, and you've got the way that the neck is formed and the muscles in the neck. And you've got the nose. Somebody has spent a hell of a lot of work on that die. It's a lot. Um, I, I should say the mould itself, but... Um, and that's that's the that's the dies that stamped in. Um, so the, these these are absolutely again the designs on these they get and this is again these are from this is about four five hundred four fifty somewhere around around there, um, and they're competing now. Um, what's what's happening? Um, they're starting <coughs> to compete. Um, we've got um, we've got a little turtle there from a Nagina coin from the four fifties Macadon. Uh, coin of uh, Canthos, leader of Macedon, uh, wrestling, and you've got writing there, it's lovely, you can't really see it on this one. And you've got As Aspendos, that looks like a symbol for the Isle of Man, and Korkira, Greece as well, from about the 300s, and you've got a cow there looking around, with its neck looking around, absolutely perfect. Um, and the Incuse designs have got more complicated, actually having a meaning, coin from Cyprus there. Um, and that itself, is the head, if I can remind myself, I can never pronounce this one. This is the head of, um, oh my God, I've got to get out my die. I'll get it on my screen. Can't, I can't remember the name. I do know the name, but it's difficult to pronounce. I need to see it. Um, this is a coin from the ruler, um, Tissa Furnace. Um, and this dates from the 450s. And, and look at that there, a, um, a Greek man, but his head's portrayed on this, um, and look at the cheek, cheekbones there, the lips, absolutely perfect. They're going through a lot of detail to compete. They're competing. The hair, the beard, beautiful. Um, and just, just sort of giving you sort of a cosmopolitan idea for Miss Sto Stockley's. Um, oh, hang on, we haven't got it on there. Hang on, just uh, bring this in. Right, for Miss Stockley's there. Coin from Firma Stockley's. Um, from about the 450s, Lycian ruler. So what you've got with this, a, a Greek Lycian ruler with, um, as a governor of um, an um, Achmedian province. So he's a Greek ruler, but he's a client king of the Achmedian world, the Persian world. He's there, and on the opposite side, you have a Persian ruler. Greek, Persian on the same coin. And again here, a Persian ruler, a Greek ruler. Um, and now per Pericles, and a Lycian ruler from South um, West Turkey. And what we've got there, um, we, we haven't really had time to do this. This is what's going on in China. They've got base metals, uh, either um, iron, um, I think these are stamp coins, um, and you've got these here, cast coins, I would say, with nothing on this side, cast into a mould. So you've got iron coins, which are coated with copper, a bit like our coins today, and... Sorry, Carl, I've got to go. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, finally, I'm just going to keep going on this one, finally this one, right? That coin itself. So they, this coin itself, um, this, this is a tetrachma, um, and this is from the Greek world. And what we're going to do, we're going to call this a day, right? So are there any questions? And those that want to stay behind for a, for a little bit, I'll show you a Roman coin. Okay. So who needs to go now? Thank you. Can I have a question? I'll go well, quickly. Okay, go quickly. Okay. Get me. Hello. I'll be with you now. Anyway, see you for Bye, everybody. Cheerio. Bye. 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 See you next week. Are you going as well? I am. See you in a few weeks. Could they find any of the I'm going to show you this Roman coin now. What's that? Did they find any of the dyes or the moulds used to make the. Not, not the. No. 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 It's 
Coming back in now, I'm going to show you. Right, folks, for those that have stayed in for a bit longer, right, I know I know we've had to rush the end bit, but um, I don't think I had enough time to do this at all today. There's this coin. Talking about Greek coin, uh, talking about Roman coins, this Roman coin itself, um, if we go with this, this is when we start to see the evolution of the Roman coin, for example. Um, and we're seeing Roman leaders' busts on coins. And I want to show you this one. And it's, it's a coin relating to the Empress Helena. And it's extremely rare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one final point and then we're going to call it a day and I'll hand this coin around. So what's, what's happening is that um, with, when coins actually come down to the Roman world, and we mentioned a lot about this, this is Vespasian Titus Domini um, Domitian. Um, the, these are on the, the Flavian house um, from about 69 to about 96 AD. And what's happening is that um, for a really early start, you know, lots of emperors are being portrayed on coins. The one thing that can be said if you're a very unpopular emperor, your coins would be recalled because you're a shamed emperor. And they are the very, very rare ones. There's some, there's some Roman coins that has only been found one or two of certain Roman emperors ever found. Um, but this coin itself that I'm going to hand around um, is, is actually a coin of the emperor, uh, one of um, Trajan's empresses, Herenia um, Etruscula. And this was uh, one of Trajan's um, wives. And this dates from roughly the... Uh, um, about two, do, do, do. No, this is a, a coin from Trajan the second actually. Two four nine AD, and this is this is solid silver, Trajan the second that is. So that's his wife. So, are there any questions on this today? Well, I wanted to ask about Britannia because they've announced they're not going to put Britannia on coins anymore, and having used it for nearly two thousand years, it seems a bit of a pity. It does. It does, it does. Um, the first representation of Britannia was obviously in the Roman world, and it was our Britannia, um, but obviously not using it after 2,000 years, a tradition gone. But lots of these things, lots of things that we do with these coins are based on traditions, with, with the portrayal of um, Darius, um, Ptolemy, Alexander the Great, uh, the representations of our own queen. Obviously it gives the standard and worth to the coins. If there's no more questions, there's one point. Go on. Just wondering, what the rule will be after this? What, what a buying power was of a gold coin in those days? You don't have to show you about gold coins, did you? Um, basically, a denarius was the the equivalent of one day's wages in the Roman world. What was the real way, though? Silver. Silver. Not silver, was it? Mm. And I think that if if I'm right in thinking, I haven't got my book with me. I think there's ten denarius in in one gold solidus or aureus. Well, they were and they weren't, but um, then, then the value was lost in the silver coins. Um, so, are there any other questions? 
What is that one made of? It's the marble, isn't it? That, that's silver. That is made of silver, yeah. That is a silver coin. Cheers, good. If there's no more questions, bye bye. thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I'll come sir. back in and we'll have a quick. Yeah. Thank you.